Peter as they make this transition. 17 years is an amazing time. And we really have so much to lift up and be thankful for. And what I want to say is, um, this is not something that I requested to God or the DS or the bishop, for that matter, who sometimes feels like God, um, <laughs> nor something that I was looking for. Um, and quite frankly, there's a, there is, I feel like I need a word from the prophet Elijah to say, do not be afraid at this time. Um, because it's not, it's sort, of, it's sort of crazy to me. What in the world was somebody thinking when they said, Emily, yeah, let's make Emily lead pastor. Um, so given that, I, I, I want to make a request to you. <laughs> I appreciate so much when uh, folks say congratulations. Um, and that's, that's actually a little jarring to me, to be honest, although I appreciate it from the spirit which it comes. Um, because sometimes we say congratulations as if like you're graduated or you're like moving on or you're moving up or doing something. And I sort of, I don't know, there's something in me, I haven't quite figured it out yet, but it feels a little jarring. So would you be willing, if you're, if you're feeling called to say that to me, could you also say, I will be praying for you right after that? So if you happen to come to me or in the coming days you want to say anything about this transition, please always tack on and I will be praying for you. I would appreciate that. Thank you. And I invite you, as always, I think one of the things that I've talked with Derek about, I don't see him, but um, I, I've talked to Derek about is I will really want to start July off um, kind of talking with all of you about this last year um, and thinking about what really worked and what hasn't and how uh, we can work better together and how God might be calling us uh, to work better together in this coming year. So please know that in July, that conversation will sort of get started. Make sense? Thank you. So <clears throat> last week, you know, uh, Bert asked me this morning, are you going to say something about the transition? We've been in the Acts of the Apostles, that book, right, and following Paul all around as he makes his travels for the last several weeks. Are you going to say anything? Because now all of a sudden we're like jumping into the Hebrew Testament, into 1 Kings, which is a radically different world, hundreds of years before, right? Are you going to say something about that? And I said, I think that's what Proverbs was. And Proverbs was said last week was stuck in there. And could you raise your hand if you were here last week and you had a conversation with folks in, in and around you about wisdom and wisdom practices? Can you just raise your hand, please, if you, if you did that? All right. So at the end of last week, we had a sort of a congregational sermon time of talking about wisdom and how we might move into the week with wisdom practices. And I want you to stop for a moment, for those of you who are here and even those who are not here, to review your week, if you would. And I'd like you to just consider, huh, maybe I was conscious, maybe I was intentional, maybe I wasn't. But where was... Where was wisdom moving? How was I practicing last week? And if there's something you notice, could you just be with it? And I invite anybody who would like to share something that they noticed or learned along the way to perhaps share it aloud, if you would. So one of the invitations was really to be in prayer for one another. And so we continue to practice that. Thanks, Bert. Others? One of the things that I feel like whenever I'm scared, um, I tend to do more listening. <laughs> and so um, the wisdom practice that I glommed onto this past week was a lot of listening. Sort of interesting. I always thought it was interesting that John Wesley... The more stuff he had to do, the more time he carved out in his morning to pray, right? Sort of like that. So I want to just close that time out and invite you to continue to be in conversation. Uh, look around, can you, at this moment, to see if the folks that you talked to were here and make it a point to connect with them. 
And I'm going back here to open the door because I know Rodney's back here and I like to see Rodney. <laughs> so. All right. So I want to begin with our sermon meditation this morning um, with thinking about the world of science, if we can. I have to admit, I do not have a head for science. Stephen often has a joke because he'll say to me, it's physics. And every time he says that, it means duh. And I'm always like, I don't get it, right? I, you say it's physics, that's nice. And he'll say, didn't you take physics? And the answer is no, right? <laughs> So um, I want to start in the world of science and in the world of kinesiology, to be exact, right? Kinesiology comes from the Greek word kinesis and means hum uh, movement, right? Movement. And so uh, kinesiology is sort of the study of human movement. Did you know there are people out there that did that? It's always weird, right? Kinesiologists, they're, they're, kinesio they're studying human. And so in the 70s, I read, these kinesiologists began to research how people do similar things, but with diverse energies. Okay, let me say that again. They do similar actions, but with diverse energies. So I thought of a simple example, like, right? Think of you walking. We all walk in different ways. Have you noticed? Some people are like saunters. Some people are really purposeful. Like you notice, like if you walk with them, they're fast walkers. They're they like purposeful walkers. Some of them, you know, there's like different gates that we have. Similar action, walking, but diverse energies, right? So another thought that came to me or example is when you say relax, right? Some people think, oh great, and they put on their running shoes and they go running for 10 miles. And other people are, you hear, relax, and they go to the spa and get a massage and smell smelly oils, right? So again, it's like the, the brain connections and your muscles are firing for different people in different ways, but similar stimulation, right? And so what they found further, these kinesiologists doing this research, was that, um, that we have something called home patterns of movement home patterns of movement. And I actually first learned about this when I was at the Pacific School of Religion in a dance class and later in the worship class that I took with Ari. So these home patterns of movement, they sort of reduce them down to four. And they're the patterns of movement that give us the most power and ease. Okay? So some of them are, the, there are four that were lifted up. There's the thruster. Right? Some people, you can just imagine things. People that like the bold movement, they like to get somewhere and the power that comes, right? They're thrusters. There's some people that are swingers. You can kind of feel it already, right? They enjoy kind of going from one thing to another and the grace that takes them there. And then they're hangers, probably the most uh, easygoing of us all. They're kind of like, okay, whatever, it's good. And then they're shapers, people that are like moving this and this and they like things kind of in order, in order to move in that order. Right? So I began to think, if there are home patterns for movement, for some reason I thought, there must be home patterns for postures and stances. I mean, look around, right? You can already see different people sitting in different ways. Now, I'm not talking about, like, the way I stand, actually. Or, like, you know, um, I often say, Stephen, sit up. Okay? <laughs> Um, I'm not talking exactly about that. I'm sort of talking about our stance, our posture towards God and towards the world. What is our home posture, if you would? And I'm going to make that leap. So I want to suggest that for our purposes today, there are three postures for us to think about. The first one is leaning. The first posture is leaning. So I want you to, exactly, Wendy is on it. This is all a big physicality thing. This isn't something in the head, friends, right? So try, scoot yourself next to somebody who doesn't seem to mind you leaning on them. And, and sort of like feel what that feels like, leaning, leaning. Or, or you can also get up and lean against the wall, right? Ah, Ari is a born leaner, right? You can also feel what it feels like to kind of lean against the wall. Your center of gravity moves away from yourself and into another, right? You can kind of feel the warmth, can't you, when you did that? So I want to think about leaning as a posture. I want to think about standing. So would you all stand? And some of us, you know, like, 
I don't know, pastors, they don't get this training, but they should because you have to stand for a long time. But they only tell you ever in weddings. The people that are brides and grooms or like the bridesmaids, they always say, bend your knees slightly, right? If you have to stand for a long time. Never stand with rigid legs. So I want you to kind of just feel it out for a second. Lean from one side to another, if you would, and feel how solid the ground is beneath you, right? And get into that place so that, you know, those people, they're Aikido masters that you can push and they kind of just move with it. Ooh, like ne Neo, Neo. I haven't seen that movie in so long. What is that movie? Yeah. Um, Matrix. Matrix. I love that movie. Okay, thank you. Sit on down. So we have leaning, standing, and then I would like you to reach your hands up because the last one, and actually feel a little bit of a burn, okay? Don't do that like, ooh. Do the like, and then kind of go from side so you get it here. I know, some of you don't work that muscle at all, like me. Okay, so you're feeling, stretching. Stretching as another posture towards God. So we're gonna kind of look at these postures, okay? And I wanna think about, are we leaners? Are we standers? Or are we stretchers towards our God and towards the world? What might give us the most power and ease in our life of faith? So let us pray. God, we give so much thanks for who you are. And for who you've called us to be. As we experiment with different postures, God... Draw us ever closer to you so that we might always know whether there's shifting ground or solid ground, whether your arms are warm or if they feel steady, whether we have the energy to stretch or the will to do it. Help us to know that you will always, always meet us. Amen. All right, so I'm going to have us do a little uh, thing today, okay? So every time you heard, hear the word lean in my sermon today, you're going to do a lean, okay? <laughs> Layla's on it. And every time you hear the word stand, you're kind of going to shift your feet and then kind of refeel the ground, okay? That's it, Matthew. And then every time you hear the word stretch, you're going to do the burn. Do the burn. Okay, all right, so here we go. You know, we meet Elijah, the prophet, at the beginning of our story when we hear that he is getting word from God to go to a place called Zarephath. We don't have good names like that anymore. Zarephath, right? But you should know that this is not the first time that God spoke to Elijah. In fact, we kind of have to go back a little bit to the first time that we meet him in scriptures. Because the first time was when God gave instructions to go and speak to the king of Israel, King Ahab. Now, here's the thing. When we meet Elijah, and Elijah knows he has to go to speak to King Ahab, Ahab was one of a long line of kings in the kingdom of Israel who pretty much were committed to harming or hurting God's heart, I'd like to say. I don't like to say they were bad people, but quite frankly, the scriptures say they were bad, right? But this king is in a long line of kings. That is just like it's getting worse and worse and worse. And if we were to go to chapter 16, it actually says Ahab did more to provoke the anger of God than had all the kings of Israel who were before him. That's in chapter 6. So imagine, okay? He, Elijah, is sent by God to talk to Ahab and say, by the way, there's going to be a drought because you are worshiping Baal. Right? And you can imagine, you don't like to give good news to your family members who probably will just get mad or sad or something, but you definitely don't want to take bad news to somebody like Ahab, right? So the next time Elijah hears from God is immediately after that because God is like, hey, I think you should go out there to the wilderness and hide, right? It actually says that he's supposed to hide in this place, this valley, Wadi Charit, right? So he, he goes out. Um, but I want to think about the fact that to go that first time, for Elijah to follow God and God's instructions on that first time to go to King Ahab, he surely had to do some serious leaning, right? And he really had to do some serious standing 
And he really had to do some serious stretching, don't you think? Don't you think? So I want to think. So he does this, and he, he, in fact, does go visit King Ahab. Then he runs away because God has come again. But here's the thing. Out there in the wilderness, what does he hear? He hears the second part of what God says. And God says to him, by the way, you'll be out there. There's this drought that's coming on, which means a famine is coming on, which means there'll be no food. But don't worry, because you know what? I'm sending a raven to feed you. Okay, how many of us would be like, raven? God, really? Raven? Right? Cyrus pointed out something very interesting this morning at Sunday school. He said, that's interesting, a raven, because ravens are kind of like those black birds that kind of seem evil. Who's making that sound? Cool, cool, Janine. <laughs> so you have to imagine for Elijah to follow God at this point, even if he fears for his life, even if he wants to hide from King Ahab, to go out into the wilderness where he knows there will be no food, but the promise that he will be fed by a raven, that surely he would need to do some serious leaning, right? He'd have to do some serious standing, and he had to do some serious stretching to even figure out, okay, what, God? But you know what? Elijah gets it together, and he follows. And in fact, we learn in the earlier chapter of 17 that the raven comes morning and night, and the meal is bread and meat. That's kind of a, not fully balanced, but, you know, pretty good from a raven. So there we have it. But the thing is, you know, a drought is coming on, so the, the river, the little wadi that was feeding, giving him something to do, dries up. And that's where our, our reading begins, because now God is saying, okay, nothing to drink, no problem, next thing, right? And now God tells Elijah to go to Zarephath, right? That's in the heart of people who are sort of worshiping Baal, another god, right? So they say, go there and go talk to a widow, because a widow will feed you. Now, you know, we might think, okay, widows, we know what widows are. Widows are people that don't, you know, their husbands have died, right? But here's the thing. In the ancient Near East, widows weren't just people that had their husbands die. In fact, maybe it would be more practical to be sent a raven than to a widow. Why? Because these widows had nothing now. They had no source of protection. They had no source of income. And unless somebody else took them in, they were destitute. And most of them became beggars and or some kind of scavengers. All right? And so what was God thinking when God said, don't, okay, no more raven, let me send you to a widow, right? That seems, again, strange. So for Elijah to follow and say, yes, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll go to Zarephath and I'll fa find this widow, would surely take some leaning. Oh, wrong movement, you guys follow me. Leaning and some standing and some stretching, don't you think? For him to follow God. But there he goes. Now, I have to say, I did not appreciate the way Elijah talked to the nameless widow, right? What does he do? He's like, he like the first thing he says is something like, give me something to drink. No, please. Where's the please? Who's, who's mama? Or not, who's his mama is more, more the question, right? No, please. And then, then it's almost like not only does he say, hey, by the way, get me something to drink. Hey, bring me something to eat, right? It's kind of impolite. I don't know. But I got over that. I got over that. Now, here's the thing. For the, for the widow to, to give him something, what does she do? She's like, she's out there in the sun, and she's not even picking up branches. The word that scripture uses, she's picking up sticks. Doesn't that make it sound even sadder? It's not even like branches to build a fire. Sticks, people. She's picking up sticks in order to make her last meal for her and her son. And here comes somebody. She's willing to get the water, right? Because water is out there doing, doing its water thing. But she thinks to herself, wait, I can't give you my last meal because I'm about to use the last little crumbly cup of flour and the last bit of oil that I have in my pantry, in my jug, to make my last meal for myself and my, my son. And then we're, we're sort of ready to die because that's all we got. So I'm, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't do that for you, right? And what does Elijah say? Elijah says, do it because uh, there's a promise there. And so I'm thinking for the widow to believe Elijah and then to follow God, 
she surely had to do some leaning. And she had to do some standing on the promises. And she had to do some stretching to think, OK, I'm going to give this stranger my last meal. Well, what do we find at the end of all this? I'm trying to save paper, and I'm not used to this turning back and forth business. I know that when God speaks, most of us aren't ready to respond immediately, right? So even though in Scripture it's like Elijah goes and then the widow does, I kind of think they hung out for a little while, especially when we're told things that seem impractical to us, like ravens will feed us or widows will feed us. And so our discernment processes sort of take different paths, don't we? Right? I appreciated the other day in a meeting, Richard was sharing his discernment process. He's one of those really careful, meticulous guys. He makes lists, pros and cons, thinks about the benefits, the costs, all of that. Right? Some of us are kind of like that. We discern. That's how we hear God. Some of us have to talk to other people. We talk it out. Right? We discern that way. Some of us go into silence. But most of us have to go through discernment to decide whether we're going to follow God or not. That crazy raven, uh, we've never seen a raven feed anybody, and we're not sure we want to do it. I've never been a lead pastor, and I'm not sure I want to do it, right? Peter and Jasmine have never been to New Vision UMC. They're not sure, maybe, entirely if they want to do it. And so we have to discern. And I'm suggesting that in order to respond to God faithfully, we need to get into the mode of leaning and get used to kind of letting our center of gravity fall into God's everlasting arms. And we need to get used to standing, like remembering firmly what are the promises of God. And we need to get into the practice of stretching, feeling the burn, friends, feeling the burn, because it surely takes a little stretching for us to do that. But I know that God is good for God's word. I know that without a doubt. So here's the thing. I don't know what God is asking of me next. Well, I'm kind of getting a glimpse right now. <laughs> but I don't know what God is asking of us next. But I do know what God has promised. I do know that. I hope you do too. I know that God has promised that God will be present with us no matter what, at all times. I know that God has promised that. I know that God has promised that God's grace will go before us, before we've even entered into a new thing, before anything. The grace has gone before us. I know that God has promised that God's grace surrounds us and encloses us. And I know that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing, right? And so we need to collectively lean into those very promises. We need to collectively stand on those promises. And we need to collectively stretch beyond ourselves, beyond what we think we can do. Steve, that's not a good stretch. We need the kind with the burn. Stretching requires a burn. We need to get fit then, friends. We need to get fit. So the, here's the thing, the Quaker, the Quaker thinker and theologian Parker Palmer said, he's quoted as saying, you don't think your way into a new kind of acting. And surely faithful behavior is a new kind of acting for most of us, all of us. But you don't think your way, like I think I need to do this, I need to do this. No, you act your way into a new kind of thinking. You act your way. So as we enter this new week, let us be in the exercise. Ari has already called us to sweat up a storm with our leaning, standing, and stretching together. Would you open your hymnals to page 374? And because we have been sitting for a while, I'd invite you to stand. We're going to sing this last verse, verse 4 of Standing on the Promises as a close to our sermon time. Sing.
Would you look around yourself and do not leave your pew, but share the peace of Christ with those around you?